Welcome everyone to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. Vasectomy, you've heard of it. Sure. It's, it's a procedure performed to make a man sterile. Not impotent, but sterile. And it's done by cutting or blocking two tubes called the vas deferens so that sperm can't get into the semen. It's done as an outpatient under local anesthesia and most of the time, I think it takes about 30 minutes. Now, more than 500,000 men, half a million men, have this procedure done every year. And a fair number of them have it done during March Madness because they <laughs> want to be on the couch anyway. <laughs> it's good strategy. Yeah. But what if something changes? What if you decide, for whatever reason, that you want to be able to have another child? Well, that requires a vasectomy reversal. And here to explain and to talk about male infertility is Mayo Clinic urologist, Dr. Savan Hilo. Welcome to the program. Great, thank you so much. It's my pleasure to be here. Dr. Uh, Hilo, it is a real pleasure to have you here because there are not too many female urologists in this world. That's true. So um, currently about 9% of practicing urologists are female. And of all urologists, only about 3% identify themselves as male infertility specialists. So and the that's amount what of, you are. Yeah. Correct. So the amount of women in that group is extremely small. At the very beginning, Dr. Shives said uh, a procedure performed to make a man sterile, not impotent, but sterile. And that correct. is probably the number one misconception. Correct. That's a very common question that patients ask is, will this affect my erectile function or my sex drive? And the answer is no. Not, not at all. That, now, how did you get interested in urology? Um, I loved urology from the beginning. I like operating, and urology combines surgery plus improving patients' quality of life, especially with what I do within urology, and it makes it an extremely rewarding field. And did you take extra training after urology residency in infertility? I did. So I trained in male infertility and sexual medicine, and I did part of my fellowship here at Mayo. So let's talk about reversing a vasectomy. Is this very common? More common than you would think. So you mentioned about half a million men each year get a vasectomy done. Um, of those, about 6% will ultimately elect to have that reversed. So, I mean, that's a higher number than you'd imagine. Why? Many reasons. Um, usually it's a change in life circumstances, um, often remarriage or loss of a child. Um, or sometimes couples change their mind and decide that they do want more children after all. Yeah, what's the average age, would you say? Um, usually men in their 30s, mid to late 30s would be most common. And when they come in and ask you if it's possible, uh, I guess obviously you tell, is there, are, is there anybody where, where you can't do it? Or do you um, have to do a pre-op workup to kind of to help determine that? Typically, obtaining the history is really key. So the number one factor that's factored in into success is how far out they are from their initial vasectomy. Um, so generally, men who are under 10 years have much higher success rates than those who are more than 10 years out from their vasectomy. Um, there isn't a patient that we wouldn't offer it to, but we certainly would counsel them regarding success rates. Since pain and possible impotency is the main reason why people are afraid to get a vasectomy, mm -hmm. is the level of pain, is, is it a bigger deal to have a reversal of vasectomy? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. So as you mentioned, a vasectomy itself is a pretty simple procedure, about half an hour. To have it reversed um, takes anywhere from two and a half to four hours. Um, so it's much more involved and we use an operating microscope to do it because what we're connecting is so small um, that we really need the magnification to do it. So recovery time is definitely longer than your initial vasectomy. Do you do it in the office? We do, and that's unique to Mayo Clinic. Uh, as far as I know, we're the only academic center um, in the country that does it in the office under local anesthesia and, um, and some sedation. But uh, insurance doesn't pay for this, right? Yes, so that's a big factor in deciding whether you want your vasectomy reversed or not is cost, as you would imagine. So um, cost varies dramatically from a few thousand dollars up to $20,000. And Depending on where you're at. Yeah, mm -hmm. and at Mayo mm -hmm. it's? It's about $5,000 if you're willing to have it done in the clinic um, and a little bit more if you want it done in the operating room under anesthesia. And most people elect to do what? Uh, I would say 90 to 95% elect to do it in the clinic. <sighs> Less so, expensive. Yes. <laughs> you're <laughs> gonna right. use a microscope. Tell us about the operation. Uh, how, how is, it's complicated or? Um, so essentially what we do at the beginning uh, is we find the spot where the initial vasectomy was done, where that tube was cut that carries the sperm. Because there's still a little incision there, you mean? or um, you There's can usually feel some it. amount of scar tissue, and some okay. people use clips, which make it easier to find. 
Um, so we find that area, we bring it up, open it up, and look for sperm under the microscope. And if we see sperm or any parts of sperm, we can make a simple connection right there with those two ends. Oh, you're looking for sperm in the end that connects to the testicle. Correct. Okay. Yep. And, and so, so you just tr uh, take a little suck a few, try to suck something out of that vas deferens, the bottom part. And usually then send it there's to the some fluid coming out, um, which oh. is a good sign too if we see fluid, and we'll take that fluid and put it on a little microscope slide and then look under a microscope for sperm wow okay so then you just connect the two if we find sperm or um, parts of sperm then we can connect it right there and then and is that uh, with stitches um, we connect it with tiny stitches yes again that's <laughs> no the reason we glow. need that's the reason <laughs> we need the microscope is the suture is so tiny it's um, finer than a strand of hair and what magnification do you use? Um, we use anywhere from 10x up to 30x. All right, so what's the recovery like? Oh, but we got to find oh. out what happens if you don't find sperm. That's oh, okay. right. Sorry. Um, so if we don't see sperm, uh, then essentially we need to make a connection from that tube that carried the sperm um, all the way to the part of the testicle itself that's called the epididymis. And that's basically where all the sperm are stored after they're made in the testicle. The um, epididymis. The epididymis. And the okay. uh, um, epididymis, making that connection takes much longer. Um, it's technically much more difficult because we're connecting two things that are so different in size. Um, it's like trying to connect a garden hose to a drinking straw, essentially. And so that's why that's much more likely to fail. And that might take three or four hours for you, to do, for you to do that. And we won't know what we're doing until the time of surgery. So you have to be prepared for either. And how often does that happen where you have to connect the vas deferens down to the testicle? The um, for patients who are more than 10 or 15 years out, that number goes up significantly. Um, so I would say maybe 10 to 20 percent of the time in general, we have to be prepared to make that more complex connection. So what's recovery like? Um, regardless of which connection we have to make, recovery is pretty similar for the patient. Um, I tell them uh, to take it easy, no jumping, uh, straining, heavy lifting for at least four weeks, which is hard because these are young guys who are really active. Um, but keeping in mind the small size of the suture we're using to connect things, I advise them if they want this to be successful, take it as easy as possible. No rugby. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> definitely no rugby. Um, so for four weeks, um, at two weeks, they can start ejaculating. And at four weeks, they can start trying with their partner. Four weeks after mm -hmm. the, the procedure. And then mm -hmm. what's the success rate? I'm sure you followed these people who have had a reverse vasectomy. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. how many of them are able to conceive? Um, so I quote patients anywhere, it's a vast range, anywhere from 30% up to 90 or even 95% success rates. And after we're done with the surgery and we know exactly what kind of connection we made, you can give them a much more specific number. But for a patient who is less than 10 years out and had a simple connection on both sides, um, those success rates are up to 90%. Do you ever, um, someone come in, comes back in and they can't conceive and you say, I can't believe that didn't work. We got to go back in there. Do you ever go back in and try again you can do a redo operation as you might imagine success rates for that are lower than the first time around your best chance is your first chance um, there's more scar tissue we have less um, of that tube to work with because we've used some of it up making that other connection um, but if patients want to redo we certainly can offer that to them all right well if you've had a vasectomy and you have a change of heart or change your mind or something life situation changes it can be reversed but I think part of the lesson here is that you don't want to let just anyone do that. <laughs> no. the, is it true? I would say the training and the experience of your surgeon will likely have the biggest impact on whether or not this operation is successful. Absolutely. After um, time from vasectomy, surgeon is definitely the next most important factor by far. Um, as you might imagine, it's not a procedure that every urologist performs um, and oftentimes is advertised on the internet with uh, very appealing prices by people who sometimes aren't urologists and sometimes aren't surgeons. So you definitely want to do your research and make sure that you get the right surgeon. And you do one to three a week. That's correct. And the interesting thing is that the pregnancy rates following vasectomy reversal are, are pretty good, somewhere between 30% up to 90 or 95%. Correct. Um, and that a lot varies on your partner. Her partner age is really the most important factor there. Time for a short break. When we come back, we'll talk about male infertility, causes, diagnosis, and treatments, and tell you the seven deadly sins of sperm.
Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. Our guest is a urologist at the Mayo Clinic, Dr. Savan Hilo. We've talked about vas deferens, vasectomy reversal, putting the vas deferens back together so that you can hopefully conceive later on and the success rates are pretty good. Now let's talk about male infertility. Uh, how do you define infertility and how often is it a problem with the male? So infertility is typically defined by the inability to conceive after one year of unprotected intercourse um, with year. a couple. Um, and that rate of infertility um, is anywhere up to 15% of couples will have trouble conceiving. It, the, because of the male. And, and if they come in and, and I presumed, do they always check the female first or do both get checked at the same time to try to figure out what the problem is? Typically, we'd recommend that both um, be checked out simultaneously. And how do you check them out? Um, on the male side of things, um, the history is really key for men. And infertility in general is an increasingly uh, greater problem than it has been. For uh, semen analyses show that um, sperm counts have dropped by nearly 40% over the last six years, just in general. Now, how do you explain that? So uh, some of the theories are that it might be environmental exposures, things that we're unaware of, constant radiation that we're exposed to. Um, other things are lifestyle factors, um, which some of which are modifiable. What are the worst ones? Um, some of the worst we'll talk about some of those <laughs> sins later on, oh, yeah. um, but uh, but some of them are just uh, common sense, you know, smoking, diet, exercise, those sorts of things. So you said sperm counts are down by forty percent over mm -hmm. the past six years. Sixty years. Sixty years. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, and we don't really have a good explanation for that, but obviously, the more sperm you have, the more likely you are to be able to conceive. Correct. Yeah. So it's really a numbers game. It does only take one sperm, um, but you need as many as you can possibly get to increase your chances. For, I mean, women are w waiting longer mm -hmm. to have their, to start their family. So mm -hmm. men are part of that equation as well. Does that make mm -hmm. a difference, the age of the father? Absolutely. Um, and you'd never know it because you hear about women and their biological clock all the time. Um, but men have a biological clock as well. So the first thing that you do is a sperm count. Correct. Okay, and let's say, um, what can be wrong there other than can there be abnormal sperm as well as not enough? So the two main things that I typically look at on the semen analysis is the counts, so the concentration of sperm, and the motility or how well that sperm is moving. Because ideally you want sperm that are motile. Um, the, those are the sperm that are going to fertilize the egg. Some of them don't swim very well. Correct. And can you fix that? Um, we can't fix it with medication or surgery, but that's where artificial reproductive technology comes in. What are the things that you can fix with regard to male infertility? So the number one thing that we can fix um, is men who have a varicocele. So that's uh, essentially like dilated veins to the testicle. I describe it to patients as varicose veins almost of the testicle. Um, those dilated veins increase the temperature surrounding the testicle, which um, decrease sperm production. Too warm. Correct. All right, yep. and you you remove those varicosities mm -hmm. uh, adjacent to the testicle, and mm -hmm. that cools the testicle down. Correct. Uh, which is, by the way, why the testicles are outside our body, right? Yes. Um, all about temperature regulation. Yeah, because they used to be up in our abdomen, right? Correct. And mm -hmm. when do they come down? What? Um, so they're supposed to descend um, before birth. Uh, and in some cases they don't, and in that case it's called an undescended testicle. And men with an undescended testicle, either on one side or both, are more likely to have problems with fertility. But you can go get it, right? We can. Usually <laughs> the quality of the sperm we'll find um, is not uh, as normal. And let's say all comers, 15% of the time it's a problem with the male when it mm -hmm. comes to conception. Mm -hmm. What, uh, how many of those can you help? What percentage so that they can conceive? I would say of that percentage, there's probably a five to 10% um, group that there's definitely something we can fix. And then there's another almost 50% of that group that there's something we might be able to modify to improve things, but that it might not be a smoking gun that we can fix. And what if that, what if you can't do that? What, what else can you do? Assisted reproductive mm -hmm. technology I'm thinking about. Yep, so other options for patients um, would be to go through uh, in vitro fertilization or intrauterine insemination. 
um, and which of those two options are available to them sometimes depends on the sperm counts of the male. You need a certain threshold to be able to do intrauterine insemination. Um, and then a large part depends on the female. So if there are any female factors that also create a challenge, then really in vitro fertilization is your best option. And sometimes you actually have to go get the sperm out of the testicle, right? Correct. So some men um, ejaculate almost no sperm or very few sperm. Um, in those cases, we can essentially do almost like a biopsy of the testicle where we retrieve sperm directly from the testicle itself. Um, and then that sperm could be used for in vitro. So what do you mean by in vitro? Um, in vitro fertilization. So they're going to um, essentially what they'll do is they will look at the sperm under the microscope, find the best sperm they can, the best quality sperm, um, and then use that sperm to fertilize an egg um, and then reimplant that into the female f to carry. Okay. And that's pretty successful. Correct. Yeah. And again, that depends um, a large part on the female and her overall health. So what, tr what treatment is available for people that are in this situation? For so, couples. So um, it depends what the issue is. Um, on the male side of things, um, part of our workup usually includes labs to look at their hormones to make sure that all the hormones are, um, are appropriate um, and are optimized for them um, for sperm production. So you mean some, they might not have enough testosterone or too much? Or? Correct. Usually it's not enough. Um, and if that's the case, there are medications we can use to try and increase the testosterone, but more so the sperm production. All right. I guess we're ready for the SINs. Well, I want to know about hundred. lifestyle remedies first mm -hmm. before we get to the I seven think that'll deadly. Probably come up and yeah. The, yeah oh, okay. Well, all right. <laughs> it will. The seven deadly sins of sperm. Is this a new book you're working on? <laughs> <laughs> it's a great it's a idea bestseller. for one. That's right. Um, so the first one we sort of uh, touched on is age. Um, you'd never think of age as a factor in men because you see all these men in Hollywood having kids well into their 60s mm -hmm. with what seems like without a problem. But um, in reality, the quality of sperm deteriorates over time. Um, and specifically, um, the uh, DNA damage within the sperm is more likely to be increased over time. And if the DNA is damaged, it's going to be less able to fertilize an egg. So you have a better chance if you're younger. Correct. Sp sin one. Correct. Don't, don't get older. Don't That's get too right. old. <laughs> um, number two uh, is alcohol. Um, so alcohol uh, also increases overall sperm concentration or the counts and the motility. And that can be with as little as one to two drinks a night, which is, you know, it's not uncommon to have a glass of wine at night. Um, so as little as one to two drinks can affect your sperm counts. Okay, number three. Um, smoking. Um, so smoking is a big one. Smoking affects um, the concentration, the motility. It decreases testosterone. Um, and not to mention all the other harmful effects of smoking as well. Smoking decreases testosterone. Correct. Wow, that should be on the side of cigarette packages. That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Number four. A different kind of smoking, marijuana, which now is much more common than it used to be. Um, as it becomes more widely available across the country and is often a popular choice among some of our younger patients. Um, right. So marijuana is interesting that the data on it is a little bit more difficult to gather. It's more difficult to study. Um, but what we do know is that it also affects sperm counts and in some cases has actually been demonstrated to change the DNA that gets passed on to the offspring, which is kind of amazing um, that it has that kind of an effect. Wow. Five. Um, so number five um, is stress. So that's a very common one and it's very difficult to avoid. But um, there, there was a couple studies that showed that as many as two or more life stressors at the same time, which were defined as either divorce or separation from a partner, death of a loved one or someone close to you, um, or even financial stress can uh, decrease your sperm counts and make it more difficult to conceive. Um, the good news is you can combat that stress um, with exercise, which is good for many other things. Um, and as little as two or more hours a week of strenuous to vigorous physical activity can help boost your sperm counts. Okay. Six and seven. Um, so a six is uh, diet, which is a big one. <laughs> um, easier said than done. Um, specifically, red processed meats appear to affect sperm counts for whatever reason. It may be some of the chemicals that's used in the preservatives of the meat. Um, so if you're looking to, uh, to conceive, I'd recommend maybe cutting back on that. And finally? Um, and then the last one, obesity. 
Um, so body mass index and waist circumference correlate directly um, to sperm counts. I guess if you really want to have a child, you really got to give up a lot of fun stuff. <laughs> That's <laughs> you have right. to be willing <laughs> yeah, to go. That's right. Yes. I've had patients say to me, uh, I've given up all the things I love in life and I've got a <laughs> halo over my head. What's left? <laughs> yeah, but I'm going to have a baby. <laughs> That's, That's right. right. <laughs> all right, Dr. Savan Hilo, we've talked about vasectomy reversal. It reconnects uh, the, the tubes, the vas deverins to each other so that you can get some uh, sperm into the semen. After the procedure, it's pretty successful. Success rates of conception anywhere between 30 and 90%. And male infertility. Not being able to conceive a child can be stressful and frustrating, but a number of male infertility treatments are available. Our thanks to Mayo Clinic urologist, Dr. Savan Hilo. Thank you. Thank you for having me.